Section 41 of the Freedman's Book by Lydia Maria Child. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Colored Mother's Prayer Great Father, who created all, the colored and the fair, O oh, listen to a mother's call, hear thou the Negro's prayer. Yet once again thy people teach, with lessons from above, that they may practice what they preach, and all their neighbors love. Again the gospel precepts give, teach them this rule to know. Such treatment as ye should receive, be willing to bestow. Then my poor child, my darling one, will never feel the smart of their unjust and cruel scorn that withers all the heart great father who created all the colored and the fair o oh, listen to a mother's call hear thou the negro's prayer end of the colored mother's prayer recording by rhonda fetterman Section 42 of The Freedman's Book by Lydia Maria Child. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. William Coston Mr. William Coston was for twenty-four years porter of a bank in Washington, D.C. Many millions of dollars passed through his hands, but not a cent was ever missing, through fraud or carelessness. In his daily life he set an example of purity and benevolence. He adopted four orphan children into his family and treated them with the kindness of a father. His character inspired general respect, and when he died in 1842, the newspapers of the city made honorable mention of him. The directors of the bank passed a resolution expressive of their high appreciation of his services and his coffin was followed to the grave by a very large procession of citizens of all classes and complexions. Not long after, when the Honorable John Quincy Adams was speaking in Congress on the subject of voting, he said, The late William Coston, though he was not white, was as much respected as any man in the district, and the large concourse of citizens that attended his remains to the grave, as well white as black, was an evidence of the manner in which he was estimated by the citizens of Washington. Now why should such a man as that be excluded from the elective franchise, when you admit the vilest individuals of the white race to exercise it? End of William Coston. Recording by Rhonda Fetterman. Section 43 of The Freedman's Book by Lydia Maria Child. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Education of Children by L. Maria Child. Strain every nerve, wrestle with every power God and nature have put into your hands for your place among the races of this Western world. Wendell Phillips people of all colors and conditions love their offspring but very few consider sufficiently how much the future character and happiness of their children depend on their own daily language and habits it does very little good to teach children to be honest if the person who teaches them is not scrupulous about taking other people's property or using it without leave it does very little good to tell them they ought to be modest if they are accustomed to hear their elders use unclean words or tell indecent stories. Primers and catechisms may teach them to reverence God, but the lesson will lose half its effect if they habitually hear their parents curse and swear. Some two hundred years ago a very learned astronomer, named Sir Isaac Newton, lived in England. He was so devout that he always took off his hat when the name of God was mentioned. By that act of reverence he taught a religious lesson to every child who witnessed it. Young souls are fed by what they see and hear, just as their bodies are fed with daily food. 
no parents who knew what they were doing would give their little ones poisonous food that would produce fevers ulcers and death it is of far more consequence not to poison their souls for the body passes away but the soul is immortal when a traveller pointed to a stunted and crooked tree and asked what made it grow so a child replied i suppose somebody trod on it when it was little it is hard for children born in slavery to grow up spiritually straight and healthy because they are trodden on when they are little being constantly treated unjustly they cannot learn to be just their parents have no power to protect them from evil influences they cannot prevent their continually seeing cruel and indecent actions and hearing profane and dirty words heretofore you could not educate your children either morally or intellectually but now that you are free men responsibility rests upon you you will be answerable before god for the influence you exert over the young souls entrusted to your care you may be too ignorant to teach them much of book learning and you may be too poor to spend much money for their education but you can set them a pure and good example by your conduct and conversation this you should try your utmost to do and should pray to the heavenly father to help you for it is a very solemn duty this rearing of young souls for eternity that you yourselves have had a stunted growth from being trodden upon when you were little will doubtless make you more careful not to tread upon them it is necessary that children should be made obedient to their elders because they are not old enough to know what is good for themselves but obedience should always be obtained by the gentlest means possible violence excites anger and hatred without doing any good to counterbalance the evil when it is necessary to punish a child it should be done in such a calm and reasonable manner as to convince him that you do it for his good and not because you are in a rage slaves all the world over are generally much addicted to lying the reason is that if they have done any mischief by carelessness or accident they dare not tell the truth about it for fear of a cruel flogging violent and tyrannical treatment always produces that effect wherever children are abused whether they are white or black they become very cunning and deceitful for when the weak are tortured by the strong they have no other way to save themselves from suffering such treatment does not cure faults it only makes people lie to conceal their faults if a child does anything wrong and confesses it frankly his punishment ought to be slight in order to encourage him in habits of truthfulness which is one of the noblest attributes of manhood if he commits the same fault a second time even if he confesses it he ought not to be let off so easily because it is necessary to teach him that confession though a very good thing will not supply the place of repentance when children are naughty it is better to deprive them of some pleasant thing that they want to eat or drink or do than it is to kick and cuff them it is better to attract them towards what is right than to drive them from what is wrong thus if a boy is lazy it is wiser to promise him reward in proportion to his industry than it is to cuff and scold him which will only make him shirk work as soon as you are out of sight whereas if you tell him you shall have six cents if you dig one bushel of potatoes and six cents more if you dig two he will have a motive that will stimulate him when you are not looking after him if he is too lazy to be stimulated by such offers he must be told that he who digs no potatoes must have none to eat the moral education which you are all the time giving your children by what they hear you say and see you do is of more consequence to them than reading and writing and ciphering but the education they get at school is also very important and it will be wise and kind in you to buy such books as they need and encourage them in every way to become good scholars as well as good men by doing so you will not only benefit them but you will help all your race 
every colored man or woman who is virtuous and intelligent takes away something of prejudice against colored men and women in general and it likewise encourages all their brethren and sisters by showing what colored people are capable of doing the system of slavery was all penalty and no attraction in other words it punished men if they did not do but it did not reward them for doing in the management of your children you should do exactly the opposite of this you should appeal to their manhood not to their fears after emancipation in the West Indies, planters who had been violent slaveholders, if they saw a freedman leaning on his hoe, would say, Work, you black rascal, or I'll flog you. And the freedman would lean all the longer on his hoe. Planters of a more wise and moderate character, if they saw the emancipated laborers idling away their time, would say, We expect better things of free men and that appeal to their manhood made the hose fly fast. Old men and women have been treated with neglect and contempt in slavery because they were no longer able to work for the profit of their masters. But respect and tenderness are particularly due to the aged. They have done much and suffered much. They are no longer able to help themselves, and we should help them as they helped us in the feebleness of our infancy, and as we may again need to be helped in the feebleness of age. Any want of kindness or civility toward the old ought to be very seriously rebuked in children, and affectionate attentions should be spoken of as praiseworthy. Slavery in every way fosters violence. Slave children, being in the habit of seeing a great deal of beating, early form the habit of kicking and banging each other when they are angry, and of abusing poor helpless animals entrusted to their care. On all such occasions parents should say to them, Those are the ways of slavery. We expect better things of free children. An Honorable Record in 1837 the colored population in Philadelphia numbered 18,768. Many of them were poor and ignorant, and some of them were vicious, as would be the case with any people under such discouraging influences. But notwithstanding they were excluded by prejudice from all the most profitable branches of industry, they had acquired property valued at one million three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Five hundred and fifty thousand was in real estate, and eight hundred thousand was personal property. They had built sixteen churches, valued at one hundred and fourteen thousand dollars, for the support of which they annually paid over six thousand dollars. The pauper tax they paid was more than enough to support all the colored paupers in the city. They had eighty benevolent societies, and during that year they had expended fourteen thousand one hundred and seventy-two dollars for the relief of the sick and helpless. A number of them who had been slaves had paid in the course of that year $70,733 to purchase their own freedom, or that of their relatives. End of Education of Children Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 44 of The Freedman's Book by Lydia Maria Child this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Thank God for Little Children by Francis E. W. Harper Thank God for little children, bright flowers by earth's wayside, the dancing joyous lifeboats upon life's stormy tide. Thank God for little children, when our skies are cold and gray, they come as sunshine to our hearts and charm our cares away. I almost think the angels who tend life's garden fair drop down the sweet wild blossoms that bloom around us here. It seems a breath of heaven round many a cradle lies, and every little baby brings a message from the skies. The humblest home with children is rich in precious gems, better than wealth of monarchs 
or golden diadems. Dear mothers, guard these jewels as sacred offerings meet, a wealth of household treasures to lay at Jesus' feet. End of Thank God for Little Children Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 45 of the Freedman's Book by Lydia Maria Child. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sam and Andy by Harriet Beecher Stowe. A beautiful slave in Kentucky named Eliza had a very handsome little boy. One day she overheard her master making a bargain with a slave trader by the name of Haley to sell them both. She made her escape that night taking her child with her. Her mistress, who was much attached to her, and did not want to have her sold, was glad when she heard that Eliza was gone. But her master, who was afraid the trader would think he had helped her off after he had taken the money for her, ordered the horses Bill and Jerry to be brought, and two of his slaves, called Sam and Andy, to go with the slave trader in pursuit of the fugitive. The way they contrived how not to overtake Eliza is thus told in Uncle Tom's cabin. "'Sam! Hello, Sam!' said Andy. "'Massa wants you to catch Bill and Jerry.' "'Hi! What's afoot now?' said Sam. "'Why, I suppose you don't know that Lizzie's cut stick and cleared out with her young'un.' "'You teach your granny,' replied Sam with infinite contempt. Knowed it a heap sooner than you did. This nigger ain't so green now. Well, anyhow, Massa wants Bill and Jerry geared right up, and you and I's to go with Massa's Haley to look out of her, said Andy. Sam, who had just been contriving how he could make himself of importance on the plantation, exclaimed, Good now, that's the time of day. It's Sam's that's called for in dees hair times. He's the nigger. Mass'll see what Sam can do. Ah, you better think twice, said Andy, for Missus don't want her cotched, and she'll be in your wool. Hi, how'd you know that? said Sam, opening his eyes. Heard her say so my own self. Dis blessed morning, when I bring in Mass's shaving water, she sent me to see why Lizzie didn't come to dress her, and when I tell'd her she was off, she just rise up and says she, The Lord be praised. Massa, he seem real mad, and says he, Wife, you talk like a fool. But Lord, she bring him too. I knows well enough how that'll be. It all is best to stand Missus side the fence. Now I tell you, said Andy. Sam scratched his woolly pate and gave a hitch to his pantaloons as he had a habit of doing when his mind was perplexed. "'Dere ain't never no sayin' about no kind of thing in dis year world,' said he at last. "'Now I'd a said sartin that missus would a scared the vassal world after Lizzie.' "'So she would,' said Andy. "'But can't ye see through a ladder, ye black nigger? "'Missus don't want dis year Massa Halley to get Lizzie's boy.' Dat's to go, and I specs you better be makin' tracks for dem hosses. Mighty sudden, too, for I hearn missus queerin' out o' you, so you've stood foolin' long enough. Sam, upon this, began to bestir himself in earnest, and after a while appeared, bearing down gloriously towards the house, with Bill and Jerry in a full canter. Adroitly throwing himself off before they had any idea of stopping, he brought them up alongside the horse-post like a tornado. Haley's horse, which was a skittish young colt, winced and bounced, and pulled hard at his halter. "'Ho, ho!' said Sam. "'Scary, are ye?' And his black face lighted up with a curious, mischievous gleam. "'I'll fix ye now,' said he. There was a large beech-tree overshadowing the place and the small, sharp, triangular beech-nuts lay scattered thickly on the ground. Sam stroked and patted the colt, and while pretending to adjust the saddle, he slipped under it a sharp little nut, 
in such a manner that the least weight brought upon the saddle would annoy the nervous animal, without leaving any perceptible wound. "'Dar, me fix em said he, rolling his eyes with an approving grin. At this moment Mrs. Shelby appeared on the balcony, and beckoned to him. "'Why have you been loitering so, Sam?' said she. "'I sent Andy to tell you to hurry.' "'Bress you, missus. Hosses won't be cotched all in a minute. "'They done cleared out down the south pasture, and everywhere,' said Sam. "'Well, Sam,' replied his mistress, "'you were to go with Mr. Haley to show him the road and help him. "'Be careful of the horses, Sam. "'You know Jerry was a little lame last week. "'Don't ride them too fast.' She spoke the last words in a low voice and with strong emphasis. "'Let dis child alone for dat,' said Sam, rolling up his eyes with a look full of meaning. "'Yes, missus, I'll look out for de hosses.' Sam returned to his stand under the beech tree and said to Andy, "'Now, Andy, I would be a tall surprised if dat all gentleman's critter should gib a fling by and by when he comes to be a getting up you know andy critters will do such things and sam poked andy in the side in a highly suggestive manner hi exclaimed andy with an air that showed he understood instantly yes you see andy missus wants to make time said sam Dad was clear to the most ordinary observer. I just make a little for her. Now, you see, get all dese yer horses loose, caper and promiscus round dis here lot, and down to the wood there, and I spec massa won't be off in a hurry. Andy grinned. You see, Andy, said Sam. If any such thing should happen as that Massa Haley's hoss should begin to act contrary and cut up, you and I just let's go of our own to help him. Oh, yes, we'll help him. And Sam and Andy laid their heads back on their shoulders and broke into a low, immoderate laugh, snapping their fingers and flourishing their heels with exquisite delight. While they were enjoying themselves in this style, Haley appeared on the veranda. Some cups of very good coffee had somewhat mollified him, and he came out smiling and talking in tolerably restored humor. Sam and Andy clawed for their torn hats and flew to the horse posts to be ready to help Massa. The brim of Sam's hat was all unbraided, and the slivers of the palm leaf started apart in every direction giving it a blazing air of freedom and defiance. The brim had gone entirely from Andy's hat, but he thumped the crown on his head and looked about well pleased, as if to ask, Who says I haven't got a hat? Well, boys, said Haley, be alive now. We must lose no time. Not a bit of him, Massa, said Sam, putting Haley's rein into his hand and holding his stirrup, while Andy was untying the other two horses. The instant Haley touched the saddle, the meddlesome creature bounded from the earth with a sudden spring that threw his master sprawling some feet off on the dry, soft turf. With frantic ejaculations, Sam made a dive at the reins, but only succeeded in brushing the torn slivers of his hat into the horse's eyes, which by no means tended to allay the confusion of his nerves. With two or three contemptuous snorts, he upset Sam, flourished his heels vigorously in the air, and pranced away toward the lower end of the lawn. He was followed by Bill and Jerry, whom Andy had not failed to let loose, according to contract, speeding them off with various direful cries. And now there was a sense of great confusion. Sam and Andy ran and shouted, Dogs ran barking here and there. Mike, Mose, Mandy, Fanny, and all the smaller specimens on the place raced, whooped, shouted, and clapped their hands with outrageous zeal. Haley's fleet horse entered into the spirit of the scene with great gusto. He raced round the lawn, which was half a mile in extent, 
and seemed to take a mischievous delight in letting his pursuers come within a hand's breadth of him, and then whisking off again with a start and a snort. Sam's torn hat was seen everywhere. If there seemed to be the least chance that a horse could be caught, down he bore upon him full tilt, shouting, "'Now for it! Cotch him! Cotch him!' in a way that set them all to racing again. Haley ran up and down, stamped, cursed, and swore. The master in vain tried to give some directions from the balcony, and the mistress looked from her chamber window and laughed. She had some suspicion that Sam was the cause of all this confusion. At last, about twelve o'clock, Sam appeared, mounted on Jerry, leading Haley's horse, reeking with sweat but with flashing eyes and dilated nostrils showing that the spirit of freedom had not yet entirely subsided he's cotched exclaimed sam triumphantly if it hadn't been for me they might have bust themselves all on em but i cotched em you growled haley if it hadn't been for you this never would have happened bress us massa exclaimed sam when it's me that's been a-racin and chasin till the sweat just pours off me well well said haley you've lost me near three hours with your cursed nonsense now let's be off and have no more fooling why massa said sam in a deprecating tone i do believe you mean to kill us all clare hosses and all here we are all just ready to drop down, and the critters all in a reek o' sweat. Sure massa won't think o' startin' now till on a dinner. Massa's horse wants rubbin' down. See how he's splashed hisself? And Jerry limps, too. Don't think missus would be willin' to have us start this year way. No how. Press you, massa. We can catch up if we stop. Libby never was no great of a walker. The mistress, who, greatly to her amusement, overheard this conversation from the veranda, now came forward and courteously urged Mr. Haley to stay to dinner, saying that the cook should bring it on the table immediately. All things considered, the slave trader concluded it was best to do so. As he moved toward the parlor, Sam rolled his eyes after him with unutterable meaning and gravely led the horses to the stable. When he had fairly got beyond the shelter of the barn and fastened the horse to a post, he exclaimed, "'Did you see him, Andy? Did you see him? Oh, Lord, if it weren't as good as a meetin' now, to see him a dancin' and a kickin' and a swearin' at us? Didn't I hear him? Swear away, old fellow,' says I to myself. "'Will you have your horse now, or wait till you catch him? says I. And Sam and Andy leaned up against the barn and laughed to their hearts' content. "'You ought to seen how mad he looked when I brought the horse up. Lor, he'd a killed me if he durs to. And there I was, a-standin' as innocent and humble. "'Lor, I seed you,' said Andy. "'Ain't you an old horse, Sam?' "'Rather specks I am,' said Sam. "'Did you see Missus upstairs at the window? "'I seed her laughing. "'I'm sure I was a-racin', so I didn't see nothin,' said Andy. "'Well, you see, I's quiet a habit of observation,' said Sam. "'It's a very potent habit, Andy, "'and I commend you to be cultivatin' it, now you're young. "'By observation makes all the difference in niggers.' didn't i see what missus wanted though she never let on that ars bobservation andy i specs it's what you may call a faculty faculties is different in different peoples but cultivation of em goes a great way i guess if i hadn't helped your bobservation this morning you wouldn't have seen your way so smart said andy you's a promising child andy there ain't no manner o doubt said sam i think lots of you andy and i don't feel no ways ashamed to take ideas from you let's go up to the house now andy 
I'll be bound missus'll give us an uncommon good bite this year time. The mistress had promised that dinner should be brought on the table in a hurry, and she had given the orders in Halley's hearing. But the servants all seemed to have an impression that missus would not be disobliged by delay. Aunt Chloe, the cook, went on with her operations in a very leisurely manner. Then it was wonderful what a number of accidents happened. One upset the butter. Another tumbled down with the water and had to go to the spring for more. Another spilled the gravy. Then Aunt Chloe set about making new gravy, watching it and stirring it with the greatest precision. If reminded that the orders were to hurry, she answered shortly that she warn't a goin' to have raw gravy on the table to help nobody's catchin's. From time to time there was giggling in the kitchen, when news was brought that Massa Haley was mighty uneasy, and that he couldn't set in his chair no ways, but was a-walkin' and stalkin' to the winders and through the porch. "'Saves him right,' said Aunt Chloe. "'He'll get wuss nor uneasy one of these days, if he don't mend his ways.' At last the dinner was sent in, and the mistress smiled and chatted and did all she could to make the time pass imperceptibly. At two o'clock, Sam and Andy brought the horses up to the posts, apparently greatly refreshed and invigorated by the scamper of the morning. As Haley prepared to mount, he said, "'Your master don't keep no dogs, I suppose.' "'Heaps on em, said Sam triumphantly. There's Bruno. He's a roarer, and besides that, about every nigger of us keeps a pup of some nature or other. But does your master keep any dogs for tracking out niggers? said Haley. Sam knew very well what he meant, but he kept on a look of desperate simplicity. Well, said he, our dogs all smells round considerable sharp. I suspect they's the kind, though they hadn't never had no practice. There's far dogs at most anything, though, if you get em started. He whistled to Bruno, a great lumbering Newfoundland dog, who came pitching tumultuously toward them. You go hang, exclaimed Haley, mounting his horse. Come, tumble up now. Sam tumbled up accordingly contriving to tickle Andy as he did so. This made Andy split out in a laugh, greatly to Haley's indignation, who made a cut at him with his riding whip. "'Astonished at you, Andy,' said Sam, with awful gravity. "'This year's a serious business, Andy. You mustn't be a making game. This year ain't no way to help Massa." When they came to the boundaries of the estate, Haley said, I shall take the road to the river. I know the way of all of them. They always make tracks for the underground. Sartin, that's the idea, said Sam. Massa Haley hits the thing right in the middle. Now there's two roads to the river, the dirt road and the pike. Which Massa mean to take? Andy looked up innocently at Sam, surprised at hearing this new geographical fact but he instantly confirmed what Sam said. "'I'd rather be clined to imagine that Lizzie'd take the dirt road, being at the least travelled,' said Sam. Though Haley was an old bird and inclined to be suspicious of chaff, he was rather brought up by this view of the case. He pondered a moment and said, "'If yer wasn't both on yer such cussed liars now,' The pensive tone in which this was spoken amused Andy prodigiously. He fell a little behind, and shook so with laughter as to run a great risk of falling from his horse. But Sam's face was immovably composed into the most doleful gravity. "'Course, Massa can do as he'd rather,' said Sam. "'It's all one to us. When I study upon it, I think the straight road is the best.' "'She would naturally go a lonesome way,' said Haley. "'I should imagine so,' said Sam. "'But gals is peculiar. "'They never does nothing you thinks they will, "'most generally the contrary. "'So if you thinks you've gone one road, "'it's certain you better go to other.' 
and then you'll be sure to find em. So I think we'd better take the straight road. Haley announced decidedly that he should go the other, and asked when they should come to it. A little piece ahead, said Sam, giving a wink to Andy. He added gravely, I studied on the matter, and I'm quite clear we ought not to go that our way. I never been over it no way. It's desperate lonesome, and we might lose our way. And now I think on it, I hear him tell dat our road was all fenced up down by the creek. Ain't it, Andy? Andy wasn't certain. He'd only hearn tell about that road, but he had never been over it. Haley thought the first mention of the road was involuntary on Sam's part, and that upon second thoughts he had lied desperately to dissuade him from taking that direction because he was unwilling to implicate Eliza. Therefore he struck briskly into the road, and was followed by Sam and Andy. The road, in fact, had formerly been an old thoroughfare to the river, but after the laying of the new pike it had been abandoned, it was open for about an hour's ride, and after that it was cut across by various farms and fences. Sam knew this perfectly well. Indeed, the road had been so long closed that Andy had never heard of it. He therefore rode along with an air of dutiful submission, only groaning occasionally, and saying it was desperate rough and bad for Jerry's foot. Now I just give you warning. I know you, said Haley. You won't get me to turn off this year road with all your fussin', so you shut up. Massa will go his own way, said Sam, with rueful submission, at the same time winking portentously to Andy, whose delight was now very near the explosive point. Sam was in wonderful spirits. He professed to keep a very brisk lookout. At one time he exclaimed that he saw a gal's bonnet at the top of some distant eminence. At another time he called out to Andy to ask if that there wasn't Liza down in the holler. He was always sure to make these exclamations in some rough or craggy part of the road, where the sudden quickening of speed was a special inconvenience to all parties concerned, thus keeping Haley in a state of constant commotion. After riding about an hour in this way, the whole party made a precipitate and tumultuous descent into a barnyard belonging to a large farming establishment. Not a soul was in sight, all the hands being employed in the fields. But as the barn stood square across the road, it was evident that their journey in that direction had reached its end. "'You rascal!' said Haley. "'You knew all about this.' "'Didn't I tell you I knowed, and you wouldn't believe me,' replied Sam. "'I telled Master it was all shut up, and fenced up, and I didn't expect we could get through. Andy heard me.' This was too true to be disputed, and the unlucky man had to pocket his wrath as well as he could. All three faced to the right about, and took up their line of march for the highway. The consequence of all these delays was— that they reached the Ohio River only in season to see Eliza and her child get safely on the other side, by jumping from one mass of floating ice to the other. "'The gal's got seven devils in her, I believe,' said Haley. "'How like a wild cat she jumped!' "'Well, now,' said Sam, scratching his head, "'I hope Mass excuse us trying dat all road.' don't think i feel spry enough for dat all no way and sam gave a hoarse chuckle you laugh exclaimed the slave trader with a growl i couldn't help it now massa said sam giving way to the long pent-up delight of his soul she looks so curious a leapin and springin ice a crackin and only to hear her plump ka chunk ka plash and Sam and Andy laughed till the tears rolled down their cheeks. "'I'll make you laugh till the other side of your mouths,' exclaimed the traitor, laying about their heads with his riding-whip. Both ducked and ran, shouting up the bank. They were on their horses before he could come up with them. 
With much gravity Sam called out, "'Good evening, Master Halley. Won't want us no longer. I spect Mrs. be anxious about Jerry. Mrs. wouldn't hear of all riding the critters over Lizzie's bridge to-night.' With a poke into Andy's ribs, they started off at full speed, their shouts of laughter coming faintly on the wind. Sam was in the highest possible feather. He expressed his exultation by all sorts of howls and ejaculations, and by divers' odd motions and contortions of his whole system. Sometimes he would sit backward with his face to the horse's tail. Then, with a whoop and a somerset, he would come right up in his place again, and drawing on a grave face, he would begin to lecture Andy for laughing and playing the fool. Anon, slapping his sides with his arms, he would burst forth in peals of laughter that made the old woods ring as they passed. With all these evolutions, he contrived to keep the horses up to the top of their speed, until between ten and eleven their heels resounded on the gravel at the end of the balcony. His mistress flew to the railings and called out, "'Is that you, Sam? Where are they?' "'Massa Haley is arrestin' at the tavern,' said Sam. "'He's dreadful fatigued, missus.' "'And Eliza, where is she, Sam?' "'Well, missus, the Lord he preserves his own. Lizzie's done gone over the river into Ohio, as markably as if the Lord took her over in a chariot of fire and two horses.' His master, who had followed his wife to the veranda, said, "'Come up here, and tell your mistress what she wants to know.' Sam soon appeared at the parlour door, hat in hand. In answer to their questions, he told his story in lively style. "'Dis year's a providence, and no mistake,' said Sam, piously rolling up his eyes. "'As missus has always been instructed on us,' that all his instruments rise up to do the Lord's will. Now, if it hadn't been for me to-day, Lizzie'd been took a dozen times. Wouldn't it I started off to horses, dis year morning, and kept em chasin' till dinner-time? And didn't I call Massa Harley five miles out of de road dis evening? Else he'd a come up with Lizzie, as easy as a dog oughta a coon. These years all providences, with as much sternness as he could command under the circumstances, his master said, "'They are the kind of providences that you'll have to be pretty sparing of, Sam. I allow no such practices with gentlemen on my place.' Sam stood with the corners of his mouth lowered in most penitential style. "'Mass quite right,' said he. "'It was ugly on me.' there's no disputin' that are, and, of course, Massa and Missus wouldn't encourage no such works. I'm sensible of dat are, but a poor nigger like me's mazin tempted to act ugly sometimes, when fellers will cut up such shines as dat are Massa Halley. He ain't no gentleman no way. Anybody's been raised as I've been can't help a seein' dat are. Well, Sam, said his mistress, as you seem to have a proper sense of your errors. You may go now and tell Aunt Chloe she may get you some of that cold ham that was left of dinner to-day. You and Andy must be hungry. Mrs. is a heap too good for us, said Sam, making his bow with alacrity and departing. Having done up his piety and humility to the satisfaction of the parlour, as he trusted, he clapped his palm-leaf on his head with a sort of free and easy air, and proceeded to the dominions of Aunt Chloe, with the intention of flourishing largely in the kitchen. End of Sam and Andy Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 46 of The Freedman's Book by Lydia Maria Child this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. John Brown and the Colored Child by El Maria Child When John Brown went from the jail to the gallows in Charleston, Virginia, December 2, 1859, 
he stooped to kiss a little colored child a winter sunshine still and bright the blue hills bathed with golden light and earth was smiling to the sky when calmly he went forth to die infernal passions festered there where peaceful nature looked so fair and fiercely in the morning sun flashed glittering bayonet and gun the old man met no friendly eye when last he looked on earth and sky but one small child with timid air was gazing on his hoary hair as that dark brow to his upturned the tender heart within him yearned and fondly stooping o'er her face he kissed her for her injured race the little one she knew not why that kind old man went forth to die nor why mid all that pomp and stir he stooped to give a kiss to her but jesus smiled that sight to see and said he did it unto me the golden harps then sweetly rung and this the song the angel sung who loves the poor doth love the lord earth cannot dim thy bright reward we hover o'er yon gallows high and wait to bear thee to the sky john brown on his way to the scaffold stooped to take up a slave child that closing example was the legacy of the dying man to his country that benediction we must continue and fulfil in this new order equality long postponed shall become the master principle of our system and the very frontispiece of our constitution hon charles sumner christ told me to remember those in bonds as bound with them to do toward them as i should wish them to do toward me in similar circumstances my conscience bade me to do that therefore i have no regret for the transaction for which i am condemned i think i feel as happy as paul did when he lay in prison he knew if they killed him it would greatly advance the cause of christ that was the reason he rejoiced on that same ground i do rejoice yea and will rejoice john brown end of john brown recording by rhonda fetterman Section 47 of The Freedman's Book by Lydia Maria Child. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Heir of Freedom by Francis E. W. Harper. Written at Niagara Falls in 1856. I have just returned from Canada. I have gazed for the first time upon free land. Would you believe it? the tears sprang to my eyes and i wept it was a glorious sight to gaze for the first time on the land where a poor slave flying from our land of boasted liberty would in a moment find his fetters broken and his shackles loosed whatever he was in the land of washington in the shadow of bunker hill monument or even upon plymouth rock here he becomes a man and a brother i had gazed on harper's ferry or rather the rock at the ferry towering up in simple grandeur with the gentle potomac gliding peacefully at its feet and i felt that it was god's masonry my soul expanded while gazing on its sublimity i had heard the ocean singing its wild chorus of sounding waves and the living chords of my heart thrilled with ecstasy i have since seen the rainbow-crowned niagara girdled with grandeur and robed with glory chanting the choral hymn of omnipotence 
but none of these sights have melted me as did the first sight of free land towering mountains lifting their hoary summits to catch the first faint flush of day when the sunbeams kiss the shadows from morning's drowsy face may expand and exalt your soul the first view of the ocean may fill you with strange delight the great the glorious niagara may hush your spirit with its ceaseless thunder it may charm you with its robe of crested spray and with its rainbow crown but the land of freedom has a lesson of deeper significance than foaming waves and towering mountains it carries the heart back to that heroic struggle in great britain for the emancipation of the slaves in which the great heart of the people throbbed for liberty and the mighty pulse of the nation beat for freedom till eight hundred thousand men women and children in the west indies arose redeemed from bondage and freed from chains end of the air of freedom Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 48 of The Freedman's Book by Lydia Maria Child This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Emancipation in the District of Columbia, April 16, 1862 By James Madison Bell Unfurl your banners to the breeze, let freedom's tocsin sound main until the islands of the seas re-echo with the glad refrain columbia's free columbia's free her teeming streets her vine-clad groves are sacred now to liberty and god who every right approves thank god the capital is free the slaver's pen, the auction block, the gory lash of cruelty, no more this nation's pride shall mock. No more within those ten miles square shall men be bought and women sold, nor infants sable-hued and fair exchanged again for paltry gold. Today the capital is free and free those halls where adam stood to plead for man's humanity and for a common brotherhood where sumner stood with massive frame whose eloquent philosophy has clustered round his deathless name bright laurels for eternity where wilson lovejoy wade and hale and other lights of equal power have stood like warriors clad in mail before the giant of the hour co-workers in a common cause laboring for their country's weal by just enactments righteous laws and burning eloquent appeal to them we owe and gladly bring the grateful tributes of our hearts and while we live to muse and sing these in our songs shall claim their parts. Today Columbia's air doth seem much purer than in days agone, and now her mighty heart, I deem, hath lighter grown by marching on. End of Emancipation in the District of Columbia Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 49 of The Freedman's Book by Lydia Maria Child. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Laws of Health by L. Maria Child. There are three things peculiarly essential to health plenty of fresh water, plenty of pure air, and enough of nourishing food. If possible, the human body should be washed all over every day. But if circumstances render that difficult, the operation should be performed at least two or three times a week. People in general are not aware how important frequent bathing is. 
the cuticle or skin with which the human body is covered is like fine network or lace by help of a magnifying glass called a microscope it can be seen that there are a thousand holes in every inch of our skin in the skin of a middle-sized man there are two million three hundred and four thousand of these holes called pores those pores are the mouths of exceedingly small vessels made to carry off fluids which are continually formed in the human body and need to be continually carried off this process is going on all the time whether we are sleeping or waking hot or cold when we are cool and at rest that which passes off is invisible and because we see no signs of it and are not sensible of it it is called insensible perspiration but in very hot weather or when we exercise violently a saltish fluid passes through our pores in great drops which we call sweat and because we can see and feel it it is called sensible perspiration if the pores of the body are filled up with dust or any kind of dirt the fluids cannot pass off through them as nature intended and being shut up they become corrupt and produce fevers and bad humors this is the reason why physicians always advise people to be careful and keep their pores open in order to do this dust and dirt should be frequently washed away many a fever and many a troublesome sore might be prevented by frequent bathing moreover the skin looks smoother and handsomer when it is washed often if a pond or river is near by it is well to swim a few minutes every day or two if not the body should be washed with a pail of water and a rag but it is not safe to go into cold water or to apply it to the skin when you are very much heated nor is it safe to drink much cold water until you get somewhat cool the best way is to plunge into water when you first get up in the morning and then rub yourself with a cloth till you feel all of a glow it takes but a few minutes and you will feel more vigorous for it all day cool water is more healthy to wash in than warm water it makes a person feel stronger and it is not attended with any danger of catching cold afterward but water directly from the well is too chilly it is better to use it when it has been standing in the house some hours garments worn next to the skin and the sheets in which you sleep imbibe something of the fluids all the time passing from the body therefore they should be washed every week i am aware that as slaves you had no beds or sheets but as freemen i hope you will gradually be able to provide yourselves with such comforts meanwhile sleep the cleanest way that you can for that is one way to avoid sickness when the skin is hot and feverish it does a great deal of good to wipe the face arms and legs with a cloth moistened with cool water changed occasionally headache is often cured by placing the feet in cool water a minute or two and then rubbing them smartly with a dry cloth sitting in cool water fifteen or twenty minutes is also recommended for headache or dizziness a cut or bruise heals much quicker if it is soaked ten or fifteen minutes in cool water then wrapped in six or eight folds of wet rag and covered with a piece of dry cloth the rag should be moistened again when it gets dry this simple process subdues the heat and fever of a wound when the throat is sore it is an excellent thing to wash the outside freely with cold water the first thing in the morning and then wipe it very dry a wet bandage at night covered with a dry cloth to keep it from the air often proves very comforting when the throat is inflamed indeed it is scarcely possible to say too much in favor of using cool water freely at suitable times fresh air is as important as good water the lungs of the human body are all the time drawing in air and breathing out air what we breathe out carries away with it something from our bodies therefore it is unhealthy to be in a room with many people without doors or windows open for the people draw in all the fresh air and what they breathe out is more or less corrupted by having passed through their bodies it is very important to health 
to have plenty of pure fresh air to breathe, no dirty things or decaying substances, such as cabbage leaves or moldy vegetables, or pools of stagnant water, should be allowed to remain anywhere near a dwelling. The pools should be filled up, and the decaying things should be carried away from the house, heaped up and covered with earth to make manure for the garden. If there is not room enough to do that, they should be buried in the ground. Whole families often have fevers from breathing the bad odors that rise from such things. It is morally wrong to indulge in any habits that injure the health or well-being of others. The bed, and the coverings of the bed, should have fresh air let in upon them every day, otherwise they retain the fluids which are passed from the body all the time. In England, children that worked in large manufactories became pale and sickly and died off fast. When doctors inquired into it, they found that the poor little creatures crept into the same bedclothes week after week and month after month without having them washed or aired. Occasional change in articles of food is healthy, as well as agreeable, but it is injurious to eat a great variety of things at the same meal. There are two good rules, so very simple that everybody, rich or poor, can observe them. First, never indulge yourself in eating what you have found by experience does not agree with you. Secondly, when you have eaten enough, do not continue to eat merely because the food tastes good. It is foolish to derange the stomach for a long time, to please the palate for a short time. If you have oppressed feelings in the head, or sour and bitter tastes in the mouth, or a tendency to sickishness, take nothing but bread and water for two or three days, and you will be very likely to save yourself from a fever. People might spare themselves many a toothache if they would rinse their mouths after every meal, and every night before going to bed remove every particle of food from between the teeth and rinse them thoroughly with water. New toothpicks should be made often for the sake of cleanliness. Dirt was a necessity of slavery, and that is one reason, among many others, why freemen should hate it, and try to put it away from their minds their persons, and their habitations. End of The Laws of Health Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 50 of The Freedman's Book by Lydia Maria Child This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. President Lincoln's Proclamation of Emancipation January 1, 1863 by Francis E. W. Harper. It shall flash through the coming ages, it shall light the distant years, and eyes now dim with sorrow shall be brighter through their tears. It shall flush the mountain ranges, and the valleys shall grow bright, it shall bathe the hills in radiance, and crown their brows with light. It shall flood with golden splendor all the huts of Caroline, and the sun-kissed brow of labor with luster new shall shine. It shall gild the gloomy prison darkened by the nation's crime, where the dumb and patient millions wait the better coming time. By the light that gilds their prison they shall see its moldering key, and the bolts and bars shall vibrate with the triumphs of the free. Though the morning seem to linger o'er the hilltops far away, now the shadows bear the promise of the quickly coming day. Soon the mists and murky shadows shall be fringed with crimson light, and the glorious dawn of freedom break refulgent on the sight. End of President Lincoln's Proclamation of Emancipation Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 51 of The Freedman's Book by Lydia Maria Child This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
New Year's Day on the Islands of South Carolina, 1863, by Charlotte L. Fortin. A few days before Christmas we were delighted at receiving a beautiful Christmas hymn from John G. Whittier, written especially for our children. They learned it very easily, and enjoyed singing it. We showed them the writer's picture, and told them he was a very good friend of theirs, who felt the deepest interest in them, and had written this hymn expressly for them to sing. This made them very proud and happy. Early Christmas morning we were wakened by the people knocking at the doors and windows and shouting, Merry Christmas! After distributing some little presents among them, we went to the church, which had been decorated with holly, pine, casina, mistletoe, and the hanging moss, and had a very Christmas-like look. The children of our school assembled there, and we gave them the nice comfortable clothing and the picture books which had been kindly sent by some Philadelphia ladies. There were at least a hundred and fifty children present. It was very pleasant to see their happy, expectant little faces. To them it was a wonderful Christmas day, such as they had never dreamed of before. There was cheerful sunshine without, lighting up the beautiful moss drapery of the oaks, and looking in joyously through the open windows. And there were bright faces and glad hearts within. After the distribution of the gifts, the children were addressed by some of the gentlemen present. Then they sang the following hymn, which their good friend Whittier had written for them. O oh, none in all the world before were ever so glad as we. We're free on Carolina's shore, we're all at home and free. Thou friend and helper of the poor, who suffered for our sake, to open every prison door and every yoke to break, bend low thy pitying face and mild, and help us sing and pray, the hand that blessed the little child upon our foreheads lay. We hear no more the driver's horn, no more the whip we fear, this holy day that saw thee born was never half so dear. The very oaks are greener clad, the waters brighter smile. Oh, never shone a day so glad on sweet St. Helen's Isle. We praise thee in our songs to-day, to thee in prayer we call. Make swift the feet and straight the way, of freedom unto all. Come once again, O blessed Lord, come walking on the sea, and let the mainlands hear the word that sets the islands free. Then they sang John Brown's Hallelujah Song and several of their own hymns. Christmas night, the children came in and had several grand shouts. They were too happy to keep still. One of them, a cunning, kittenish little creature, named Amaretta, only six years old, has a remarkably sweet voice. "'Oh, miss,' said she, "'all I want to do is to sing and shout.' And sing and shout she did, to her heart's content. She reads nicely, and is very fond of books." Many of the children already know their letters. The parents are eager to have them learn. They sometimes say to me, Do, miss, let the children learn everything they can. We never have no chance to learn nothing, but we wants the children to learn. They are willing to make many sacrifices that their children may attend school. One old woman, who had a large family of children and grandchildren, came regularly to school in the winter, and took her seat among the little ones. Another woman, who had one of the best faces I ever saw, came daily, and brought her baby in her arms. It happened to be one of the best babies in the world, and allowed its mother to pursue her studies without interruption. New Year's Day, Emancipation Day, 
was a glorious one to us. General Saxton and Colonel Higginson had invited us to visit the camp of the 1st Regiment of South Carolina Volunteers on that day, the greatest day in the nation's history. We enjoyed perfectly the exciting scene on board the steamboat Flora. There was an eager, wondering crowd of the freed people in their holiday attire, with the gayest of headkerchiefs, the whitest of aprons, and the happiest of faces. The band was playing, the flags were streaming, and everybody was talking merrily and feeling happy. The sun shone brightly, and the very waves seemed to partake of the universal gaiety, for they danced and sparkled more joyously than ever before. Long before we reached Camp Saxton, we could see the beautiful grove and the ruins of the old fort near it. Some companies of the 1st Regiment were drawn up in line under the trees near the landing, ready to receive us. They were a fine, soldierly-looking set of men, and their brilliant dress made a splendid appearance among the trees. It was my good fortune to find an old friend among the officers. He took us over to camp and showed us all the arrangements. Everything looked clean and comfortable, much neater, we were told, than in most of the white camps. An officer told us that he had never seen a regiment in which the men were so honest. In many other camps, said he, the colonel and the rest of us would find it necessary to place a guard before our tents. We never do it here. Our tents are left entirely unguarded, but nothing has ever been touched. We were glad to know that. It is a remarkable fact when we consider that the men of this regiment have all their lives been slaves for we all know that slavery does not tend to make men honest. The ceremony in honor of emancipation took place in the beautiful grove of live oaks adjoining the camp. I wish it were possible to describe fitly the scene which met our eyes as we sat upon the stand and looked down on the crowd before us. There were the black soldiers in their blue coats and scarlet pantaloons, the officers of the 1st Regiment and of other regiments in their handsome uniforms, and there were crowds of lookers-on, men, women, and children of every complexion, grouped in various attitudes under the moss-hung trees. The faces of all wore a happy, interested look. The exercises commenced with a prayer by the chaplain of the regiment. An ode, written for the occasion, was then read and sung. President Lincoln's proclamation of emancipation was then read, and enthusiastically cheered. The Reverend Mr. French presented Colonel Higginson with two very elegant flags, a gift to the 1st Regiment, from the Church of the Puritans in New York. He accompanied them by an appropriate enthusiastic speech. As Colonel Higginson took the flags, before he had time to reply to the speech, some of the colored people of their own accord began to sing, My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee we sing. It was a touching and beautiful incident, and sent a thrill through all our hearts. The colonel was deeply moved by it. He said that reply was far more effective than any speech he could make but he did make one of those stirring speeches which are half battles. All hearts swelled with emotion as we listened to his glorious words, stirring the soul like the sound of a trumpet. His soldiers are warmly attached to him, and he evidently feels toward them as if they were all his children. General Saxton spoke also and was received with great enthusiasm. Throughout the morning, repeated cheers were given for him by the regiment, and joined in heartily by all the people. They know him to be one of the best and noblest men in the world. His unfailing kindness and consideration for them, so different from the treatment they have sometimes received at the hands of United States officers, have caused them to have unbounded confidence in him. At the close of Colonel Higginson's speech, he presented the flags to the color-bearers, Sergeant Rivers and Sergeant Sutton, with an earnest charge 
to which they made appropriate replies. Mrs. Gage uttered some earnest words, and then the regiment sang John Brown's Hallelujah Song. After the meeting was over, we saw the dress parade, which was a brilliant and beautiful sight. An officer told us that the men went through the drill remarkably well, and learned the movements with wonderful ease and rapidity. To us it seemed strange as a miracle to see this regiment of blacks, the first mustered into the service of the United States, thus doing itself honor in the sight of officers of other regiments, many of whom doubtless came to scoff. The men afterward had a great feast, ten oxen having been roasted whole for their especial benefit. In the evening there was the softest, loveliest moonlight. We were very unwilling to go home, for besides the attractive society, we knew that the soldiers were to have grand shouts and a general jubilee that night. But the steamboat was coming, and we were obliged to bid a reluctant farewell to Camp Saxton and the hospitable dwellers therein. We walked the deck of the steamer singing patriotic songs, and we agreed that moonlight and water had never looked so beautiful as they did that night. At Beaufort we took the rowboat for St. Helena. The boatmen, as they rowed, sang some of their sweetest, wildest hymns. It was a fitting close to such a day. Our hearts were filled with an exceeding great gladness, for although the government had left much undone, we knew that freedom was surely born in our land that day. It seemed too glorious a good to realize, this beginning of the great work we had so longed for and prayed for. It was a sight never to be forgotten, that crowd of happy black faces from which the shadow of slavery had forever passed. Forever free, forever free! Those magical words in the President's proclamation were constantly singing themselves in my soul. End of New Year's Day on the Islands of South Carolina Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 52 of The Freedman's Book by Lydia Maria Child This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Song of the Negro Boatmen at Port Royal, South Carolina, by John G. Whittier. Oh, praise and thanks, de Lord he come to set de people free, and massa think it day a doom, and we of jubilee. De Lord that heap de Red Sea waves, he just as strong as den. He say de word, we last night slaves. Today, de Lord's free men. De yam will grow, de cotton blow, we'll have de rice and corn. Oh, never you fear, if never you hear, de driver blow his horn. Old massa, on he travels gone, he leaf de land behind. De Lord's breath blow him further on, like corn shuck in de wind. We own de hoe, we own de plow, we own de hands that hold. We sell de pig, we sell de cow, but never child be sold. We pray de Lord, he give us signs dat some day we be free. De north wind tell it to de pines, de wild duck to de sea. We think it when de church bell ring, we dream it in de dream. De rice bird mean it when he sing, de eagle when he scream. We know de promise never fail, and never lie de word. So like de apostles in de jail, we waited for de Lord. And now he open every door, and throw away de key. He think we love him so before, we love him better free. De yam will grow, de cotton blow, he'll give de rice and corn. 
Oh, never you fear, if never you hear the driver blow his horn. End of The Song of the Negro Boatman at Port Royal, South Carolina Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 53 of The Freedman's Book by Lydia Maria Child This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Extract from Speech by Honorable Henry Wilson to the Colored People in Charleston, South Carolina April 1865 For twenty-nine years, in private life and in public life, at all times and on all occasions, I have spoken and voted against slavery, and in favor of the freedom of every man that breathes God's air or walks his earth. And today, standing here in South Carolina, I feel that the slave power we have fought so long is under my heel, and that the men and women held in bondage so long are free for evermore. Understanding this to be your position, that you are for ever free, remember, oh, remember, the sacrifices that have been made for your freedom, and be worthy of the blessing that has come to you. I know you will be. Through these four years of bloody war, you have always been loyal to the old flag of the country. You have never betrayed the Union soldiers who were fighting the battles of the country. You have guided them, you have protected them, you have cheered them. You have proved yourselves worthy the great situation in which you were placed by the slaveholders' rebellion. Four years ago you saw the flag of your country struck down from Fort Sumter. Yesterday you saw the old flag go up again. Its stars now beam with a brighter luster. You know now what the old flag means, that it means liberty to every man and woman in the country. You have been patient. You have endured. You have trusted in God and your country and the God of our fathers has blessed our country, and he has blessed you. The long, dreary, chilly night of slavery has passed away forevermore, and the sun of liberty casts its broad beams upon you today. But your duties commence with your liberties. Remember that you are to be obedient faithful, true, and loyal to the country for evermore. Remember that you are to educate your children, that you are to improve their condition, that you are to make a brighter future for them than the past has been to you. Remember that you are to be industrious. Freedom does not mean that you are not to work. It means that when you do work, you shall have pay for it to carry home to your wives and the children of your love. Liberty means the liberty to work for yourselves, to have the fruits of your labor, to better your own condition and improve the condition of your children. I want every man and woman to understand that every neglect of duty, every failure to be industrious, to be economical, to support yourselves, to take care of your families, to secure the education of your children, will be put in the faces of your friends as a reproach. Your old masters will point you out and say to us, We told you so. For more than thirty years we have said that you were fit for liberty. We have maintained it amid obloquy and reproach. For maintaining this doctrine in the halls of Congress, our names have been made a byword. The great lesson for you in the future is to prove that we were right, to prove that you were worthy of liberty. We simply ask you, in the name of your friends, in the name of our country, to show by your good conduct and by efforts to improve your condition that you were worthy of freedom, to prove to all the world 
even to your old masters and mistresses, that it was a sin against God to hold you in slavery, and that you are worthy to have your names enrolled among the free men of the United States of America. We want you to respect yourselves, to walk erect with the consciousness that you are free men. Be humane and kind to each other, always serving each other when you can. Be courteous and gentlemanly to everybody on earth, black and white, but cringe to nobody. You have helped us to fight our battles. You have stood by the old flag. You have given us your prayers, and you have had the desire of your hearts fulfilled. The cause of freedom has triumphed, and in our triumph we want all to stand up and rejoice together. End of Extract from Speech by Honorable Henry Wilson to the Colored People in Charleston, South Carolina, April 1865 Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 54 of The Freedman's Book by Lydia Maria Child This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Extract from a speech by Honorable Judge Kelly to the Colored People in Charleston, South Carolina, April 1865 I will not, my colored friends, talk to you of the past. You understand that all too well. I turn to the hopeful future, not to flatter you for the deeds you have done during the last four years, but to remind you that, though you no longer have earthly masters, there is a ruler in heaven whom you are bound to obey, that great being who strengthened and guided your eminent friend, William Lloyd Garrison, who trained Abraham Lincoln for his great work, in honest poverty and simple-mindedness. That good God, whose stars shine the same over the slaves' huts and the masters' palaces. His laws you must obey. You must worship him not only at the altar, but in every act of your daily life. It will not be enough to observe the Sabbath, to go to him with your sorrows, and remember him in your joys. You must remember that he has said to man, In the sweat of thy brow shall thou eat thy bread. Labor is the law of all. Your friends in the North appeal to you to help them in the great work they undertook to do for you. We want you to work with us. We want you to do it by working here in South Carolina, earning wages, taking care of your money and making profit out of that money. Work on the plantation, if that is all you can do. If you can work in the workshop, do it, and work well. He who does a day's work not so well as he might have done it, cheats himself. Strive that your work on Monday shall be better done than it was on Saturday. And when Saturday comes round again, you will be able to do a still more skillful day's work. We at the North sometimes learn three or four trades. If any one of you feels sure that he can do better for himself and his family by changing his pursuit, he had better change it. I like to look at the women assembled here. Remember, my friends, that you are to be mothers and wives in the homes of free men. You must try to make those homes respectable and happy. You are to be the mothers of American citizens. You must give them the best education you can. You must strive to make them intelligent, educated, moral, patriotic, and religious men. Many of you cannot read, but you are not too old yet to learn. A mother who knows how to read can half-educate her own child by helping him with his lessons, and the mother who has but little learning will get a great deal more by trying to hear the child's lessons, and so it is with the father. You need no longer live in slave huts, now that you are to have your own earnings. 
I charge you, men, to make your homes comfortable, and you, women, to make them happy. Work industriously. Be faithful to each other. Be true and honest with all men. If you respect yourselves, others will respect you. There are northerners who are prejudiced against you, but you can find the way to their hearts and consciences through their pockets. When they find that there are colored tradesmen who have money to spend, and colored farmers who want to buy goods of them, they will no longer call you Jack and Joe. They will begin to think that you are Mr. John Black and Mr. Joseph Brown. End of Extract from a Speech by Honorable Judge Kelly to the Colored People in Charleston, South Carolina, April 1865 Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 55 of the Freedman's Book by Lydia Maria Child This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Black Tom by a Yankee Soldier Hunted by his rebel master over many a hill and glade, Black Tom, with his wife and children, found his way to our brigade. Tom had sense and truth and courage, often tried where danger rose. Once our flag his strong arm rescued from the grasp of rebel foes. One day... Tom was marching with us through the forest as our guide, when a ball from traitor's rifle broke his arm and pierced his side. On a litter white men bore him through the forest drear and damp, laid him, dying, where our banners brightly fluttered o'er our camp. Pointing to his wife and children, while he suffered racking pain, said he to our soldiers round him, Don't let them be slaves again. No, by heaven, spoke out a soldier, and that oath was not profane. Our brigade will still protect them. They shall ne'er be slaves again. Over old Tom's dusky features, came and stayed a joyous ray and with saddened friends around him his free spirit passed away at rodman's point in north carolina the united states troops were obliged to retreat before rebels who outnumbered them ten to one the scow in which they attempted to escape stuck in the mud and could not be moved with poles while the soldiers were lying down, they were in some measure protected from rebel bullets, but whoever jumped into the water to push the boat off would certainly be killed. A vigorous black man who was with them said, Lie still, I will push off the boat. If they kill me, it is nothing. But you are soldiers, and are needed to fight for the country. He leaped overboard, pushed off the boat, and sprang back, pierced by seven bullets. He died two days after. I wish I knew his name, for it deserves to be recorded with the noblest heroes the world has known. End of Black Tom Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 56 of the Freedman's Book by Lydia Maria Child. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Letter from a Freedman to his old master, written just as he dictated it. Dayton, Ohio, August 7, 1865. To my old master, Colonel P. H. Anderson, Big Spring, Tennessee. Sir, I got your letter and was glad to find that you had not forgotten, Jordan, and that you wanted me to come back and live with you again, promising to do better for me than anybody else can. I have often felt uneasy about you. I thought the Yankees would have hung you long before this, 
for harboring Rebs they found at your house. I suppose they never heard about your going to Colonel Martin's to kill the Union soldier that was left by his company in their stable. Although you shot at me twice before I left you, I did not want to hear of your being hurt, and I am glad you are still living. It would do me good to go back to the dear old home again, and see Miss Mary and Miss Martha and Alan, Esther, Green, and Lee. Give my love to them all, and tell them I hope we will meet in the better world, if not in this. I would have gone back to see you all when I was working in the Nashville hospital, but one of the neighbors told me that Henry intended to shoot me if he ever got a chance. I want to know particularly what the good chance is you propose to give me. I am doing tolerably well here. I get twenty-five dollars a month, with victuals and clothing, have a comfortable home for Mandy. The folks call her Mrs. Anderson, and the children, Millie, Jane, and Grundy, go to school and are learning well. The teacher says Grundy has a head for a preacher. They go to Sunday school, and Mandy and me attend church regularly. We are kindly treated. Sometimes we overhear others saying, Them colored people were slaves, down in Tennessee. The children feel hurt when they hear such remarks, but I tell them it was no disgrace in Tennessee to belong to Colonel Anderson. Many darkies would have been proud, as I used to be, to call you master. Now if you will write and say what wages you will give me, I will be better able to decide whether it would be to my advantage to move back again. As to my freedom, which you say I can have, there is nothing to be gained on that score, as I got my free papers in 1864 from the Provost Marshal General of the Department of Nashville. Mandy says she would be afraid to go back without some proof that you were disposed to treat us justly and kindly, and we have concluded to test your sincerity by asking you to send us our wages for the time we served you. This will make us forget and forgive old scores, and rely on your justice and friendship in the future. I served you faithfully for thirty-two years, and Mandy twenty years. At twenty-five dollars a month for me, and two dollars a week for Mandy, our earnings would amount to eleven thousand six hundred and eighty dollars. Add to this the interest for the time our wages have been kept back, and deduct what you paid for our clothing and three doctor's visits to me, and pulling a tooth for Mandy, and the balance will show what we are in justice entitled to. Please send the money by Adams Express, in care of V. Winters, Esquire, Dayton, Ohio. If you fail to pay us for faithful labors in the past, we could have little faith in your promises in the future. We trust the good Maker has opened your eyes to the wrongs which you and your fathers have done to me and my fathers, in making us toil for you for generations without recompense. Here I draw my wages every Saturday night, but in Tennessee there was never any payday for the Negroes, any more than for the horses and cows. Surely there will be a day of reckoning for those who defraud the laborer of his hire. In answering this letter, please state if there would be any safety for my Millie and Jane, who are now grown up, and both good-looking girls. You know how it was with poor Matilda and Catherine. I would rather stay here and starve, and die if it come to that, than have my girls brought to shame by the violence and wickedness of their young masters. You will also please state if there has been any schools open for the colored children in your neighborhood. The great desire of my life now is to give my children an education, and have them form virtuous habits. Say howdy to George Carter, and thank him for taking the pistol from you when you were shooting at me. From your old servant, Jordan Anderson. Sergeant W. H. Carney of New Bedford, Massachusetts, was very severely wounded when the famous 54th Regiment attacked Fort Wagner, but he resolutely held up the Stars and Stripes 
as he dragged his wounded limb along amid a shower of bullets, and when he reached his comrades he exclaimed exultingly, the dear old flag has never touched the ground, boys. End of Letter from a Freedman to His Old Master Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 57 of The Freedman's Book by Lydia Maria Child This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Colonel Robert G. Shaw by Eliza B. Sedgwick. In the summer of 1863, an attack was made on Fort Wagner in South Carolina by the 54th Massachusetts Regiment, composed of colored troops. Their leader, Colonel Shaw, belonging to one of the best white families in Boston, was killed. When his friends asked for his body, the reply of the rebels was, He is buried with his niggers. buried with a band of brothers whom for him would fain have died buried with the gallant fellows who fell fighting by his side buried with the men god gave him those whom he was sent to save buried with the martyred heroes he has found an honored grave buried where his dust so precious makes the soil a hallowed spot buried where by christian patriot he shall never be forgot buried in the ground accursed which man's fettered feet have trod buried where his voice still speaketh appealing for the slave to god fare thee well thou noble warrior who in youthful beauty went on a high and holy mission by the god of battle sent chosen of him elect and precious well didst thou fulfil thy part when thy country counts her jewels she shall wear thee on her heart End of Colonel Robert G. Shaw Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 58 of The Freedman's Book by Lydia Maria Child This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Advice from an Old Friend by L. Maria Child For many years I have felt great sympathy for you, my brethren and sisters, and I have tried to do what I could to help you to freedom. And now that you have at last received the long-desired blessing, I most earnestly wish that you should make the best possible use of it. I have made this book to encourage you to exertion by examples of what colored people are capable of doing. Such men and women as Toussaint Levature, Benjamin Banneker, Phyllis Wheatley, Frederick Douglass, and William and Ellen Crafts prove that the power of character can overcome all external disadvantages, even that most crushing of all disadvantages, slavery. Perhaps few of you will be able to stir the hearts of large assemblies by such eloquent appeals as those of Frederick Douglass or be able to describe what you have seen and heard so gracefully as Charlotte L. Fortin does. Probably none of you will be called to govern a state as Toussaint Levature did, for such a remarkable career as his does not happen once in hundreds of years. But the Bible says, He that ruleth his own spirit is greater than he that ruleth the kingdom. And such a ruler every man and woman can become, by the help and blessing of God. It is not the greatness of the thing a man does which makes him worthy of respect. It is the doing well whatsoever he hath to do. In many respects your opportunities for usefulness are more limited than those of others. But you have one great opportunity peculiar to yourselves. You can do a vast amount of good to people in various parts of the world, and through successive generations, 
by simply being sober, industrious, and honest. There are still many slaves in Brazil and in the Spanish possessions. If you are vicious, lazy, and careless, their masters will excuse themselves for continuing to hold them in bondage by saying, Look at the freedmen of the United States. What idle vagabonds they are! How dirty their cabins are! How slovenly their dress! That proves that Negroes cannot take care of themselves, that they are not fit to be free. But if your houses look neat, and your clothes are clean and whole, and your gardens well weeded, and your work faithfully done, whether for yourselves or others, then all the world will cry out, You see that Negroes can take care of themselves, and it is a sin and a shame to keep such men in slavery. Thus, while you are serving your own interests, you will be helping on the emancipation of poor, weary slaves in other parts of the world. It is a great privilege to have a chance to do extensive good by such simple means, and your Heavenly Father will hold you responsible for the use you make of your influence. Your manners will have a great effect in producing an impression to your advantage or disadvantage. Be always respectful and polite toward your associates and toward those who have been in the habit of considering you an inferior race. It is one of the best ways to prove that you are not inferior. Never allow yourselves to say or do anything in the presence of women of your own color which it would be improper for you to say or do in the presence of the most refined white ladies. Such a course will be an education for them as well as for yourselves. When you appoint committees about your schools and other public affairs, it would be wise to have both men and women on the committees. The habit of thinking and talking about serious and important matters makes women more sensible and discreet. Such consultations together are in fact a practical school both for you and them. And the more modest and intelligent women are, the better will children be brought up. Personal appearance is another important thing. It is not necessary to be rich in order to dress in a becoming manner. A pretty dress for festival occasions will last a long while, if well taken care of, and a few wild flowers or bright berries will ornament young girls more tastefully than jewels. Working clothes that are clean and nicely patched always look respectable, and they make a very favorable impression, because they indicate that the wearer is neat and economical. And here let me say that it is a very great saving to mend garments well, and before the rents get large. We thrifty Yankees have a saying that a stitch in time saves nine, and you will find by experience that neglected mending will require more than nine stitches instead of one, and will not look so well when it is done. The appearance of your villages will do much to produce a favorable opinion concerning your characters and capabilities. Whitewash is not expensive, and it takes but little time to transplant a Cherokee rose, a jessamine, or other wild shrubs and vines that make the poorest cabins look beautiful. And, once planted, they will be growing while you are working or sleeping. It is a public benefit to remove everything dirty or unsightly, and to surround homes with verdure and flowers, for a succession of pretty cottages makes the whole road pleasant, and cheers all passers-by, while they are at the same time an advertisement, easily read by all men, that the people who live there are not lazy, slovenly, or vulgar. The rich pay a great deal of money for pictures to ornament their walls, but a whitewashed cabin, with flowering shrubs and vines clustering round it, is a pretty picture, freely exhibited to all men. It is a public benefaction. But even if you are as yet too poor to have a house and garden of your own, it is still in your power to be a credit and an example to your race. 
by working for others as faithfully as you would work for yourself by taking as good care of their tools as you would if they were your own by always keeping your promises however inconvenient it may be by being strictly honest in all your dealings by being temperate in your habits and never speaking a profane or indecent word by pursuing such a course you will be consoled with an inward consciousness of doing right in the sight of god and be a public benefactor by your example while at the same time you will secure respect and prosperity for yourself by establishing a good character a man whose conduct inspires confidence is in a fair way to have a house and land of his own even if he starts in the world without a single cent be careful of your earnings and as saving in your expenses as is consistent with health and comfort but never allow yourselves to be stingy avarice is a mean vice which eats all the heart out of a man money is a good thing and you ought to want to earn it as a means of improving the condition of yourselves and families but it will do good to your character and increase your happiness if you impart a portion of your earnings to others who are in need help as much as you conveniently can in building churches and schoolhouses for the good of all and in providing for the sick and the aged if your former masters and mistresses are in trouble show them every kindness in your power whether they have treated you kindly or not remember the words of the blessed jesus do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you there is one subject on which i wish to guard you against disappointment do not be discouraged if freedom brings you more cares and fewer advantages than you expected such a great change as it is from slavery to freedom cannot be completed all at once by being brought up as slaves you have formed some bad habits which it will take time to correct those who were formerly your masters have acquired still worse habits by being brought up as slaveholders and they cannot be expected to change all at once both of you will gradually improve under the teaching of new circumstances for a good while it will provoke many of them to see those who were once their slaves acting like free men they will doubtless do many things to vex and discourage you just as the slaveholders in jamaica did after emancipation there they seem to want to drive the emancipated bondmen to insurrection that they might have a pretext for saying you see what a bad effect freedom has on negroes we told you it would be so but the colored people of jamaica behaved better than their former masters wished them to do they left the plantations where they were badly treated or poorly paid but they worked diligently elsewhere their women and children raised vegetables and fowls and carried them to market and by their united industry and economy they soon had comfortable little homes of their own I think it would generally be well for you to work for your former masters, if they treat you well, and pay you as much as you could earn elsewhere. But if they show a disposition to oppress you, quit their service, and work for somebody who will treat you like free men. If they use violent language to you, never use impudent language to them. If they cheat you, scorn to cheat them in return if they break their promises never break yours if they propose to women such connections as used to be common under the bad system of slavery teach them that freed women not only have the legal power to protect themselves from such degradation but also that they have pride of character if in fits of passion they abuse your children as they formerly did never revenge it by any injury to them or their property it is an immense advantage to any man always to keep the right on his side 
if you pursue this course you will always be superior however rich or elegant may be the man or woman who wrongs you i do not mean by this that you ought to submit tamely to insult or oppression stand up for your rights but do it in a manly way quit working for a man who speaks to you contemptuously or who tries to take a mean advantage of you when you are doing your duty faithfully by him if it becomes necessary apply to magistrates to protect you and redress your wrongs if you are so unlucky as to live where the men in authority whether civil or military are still disposed to treat the colored people as slaves let the most intelligent among you draw up a statement of your grievances and send it to some of your firm friends in congress such as the hon charles sumner the hon henry wilson and the hon george w julian a good government seeks to make laws that will equally protect and restrain all men heretofore you had no reason to respect the laws of this country because they punished you for crime in many cases more severely than white men were punished while they did nothing to protect your rights but now that good president lincoln has made you free you will be legally protected in your rights and restrained from doing wrong just as other men are protected and restrained it is one of the noblest privileges of free men to be able to respect the law and to rely upon it always for redress of grievances instead of revenging one wrong by another wrong you will have much to put up with before the new order of things can become settled on a permanent foundation i am grieved to read in the newspapers how wickedly you are still treated in some places but i am not surprised for i knew that slavery was a powerful snake that would try to do mischief with its tail after its head was crushed but whatever wrongs you may endure comfort yourself with two reflections first that there is the beginning of a better state of things from which your children will derive much more benefit than you can secondly that a great majority of the american people are sincerely determined that you shall be protected in your rights as free men year by year your condition will improve year by year if you respect yourselves you will be more and more respected by white men wonderful changes have taken place in your favor during the last thirty years and the changes are still going on the abolitionists did a great deal for you by their continual writing and preaching against slavery then this war enabled thousands of people to see for themselves what a bad institution slavery was and the uniform kindness with which you treated the yankee soldiers raised you up multitudes of friends there are still many pro-slavery people in the northern states who from aristocratic pride or low vulgarity still call colored people niggers and treat them as such but the good leaven is now fairly worked into public sentiment and these people let them do what they will, cannot get it out. The providence of God has opened for you an upward path. Walk ye in it, without being discouraged by the brambles and stones at the outset. Those who come after you will clear them away, and will place in their stead strong, smooth rails for the steam car called Progress of the Colored Race. End of Advice from an Old Friend Recording by Rhonda Fetterman Section 59 of the Freedman's Book by Lydia Maria Child This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Day of Jubilee by A. G. Duncan Roll on, thou joyful day! when tyranny's proud sway stern as the grave shall to the ground be hurled and freedom's flag unfurled shall wave throughout the world 
o'er every slave trump of glad jubilee echo o'er land and sea freedom for all let the glad tidings fly and every tribe reply glory to god on high at slavery's fall end of day of jubilee recording by rhonda fetterman End of The Freedman's Book by Lydia Maria Child